Hello, I'm Adam Shepherd, And I'm Jane McCallion. And you're listening to the IT Pro Podcast, where today we've got ahead in some slightly different clouds. So COVID-19 and the travel restrictions that came along with it have placed a great deal of pressure on the travel industry. Not only is international air travel largely unviable for the immediate future, the rapid rise of remote working means that, in the future, many business trips could be replaced by a simple video call. The airline industry isn't simply planning to give up, however. Instead, it's using the downtime that COVID-19 has introduced into its usually round-the-clock schedule to overhaul its IT operations, making them faster, cheaper and more environmentally friendly. Joining us this week to explain how the air industry is transforming itself through the pandemic is Pascal Bouchner, CIO of the International Air Transport Association. Pascal, welcome to the show. Yes, uh, good morning, uh, Jane. Good morning, Adam. And um, I'm glad to be here with you. We're glad to have you. Uh, So first of all, can you tell us a little bit about IATA and what it does in the travel sector? Okay, so IATA is the uh, International Air Transport Association. So we are representing about 290 airlines, which is about uh, 82% of you know, the, the, the total air traffic. And we are uh, the, the trade association responsible for all the global standards, uh, mainly for safety, security. But we are also the, uh, the clearing house you know, for all you know, the, uh, the, the ticket sales via you know, travel agencies, via the indirect channels. So we've been founded uh, uh, 75 years ago. Uh, we started in Cuba, and uh, so we are representing uh, the voice of the of the commercial uh, aviation industry, and we are working very close also with uh, ICAO, so the, the the International Civil Aviation Organization, in terms of you know international standards for the aviation. So, as I mentioned during the introduction, obviously, uh, COVID-19 has dramatically affected the airline industry. But as I understand it, IATA has recently embarked on a major digital transformation project. So, were there any particular pain points that prompted this? Okay, so we had, we had before the crisis, anyway, uh, a digital transformation agenda because we, uh, we had the plan uh, to improve our, our industry and one of the biggest improvements was you know the, the carbon footprint and the, 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 the reduction of you know the, the, the carbon emission. Uh, mm-hmm. We uh, before the crisis you know the plan was to uh, to deal with uh, an increase of the volume of passenger and of course you know the crisis has stopped all this mm-hmm. and suddenly mm-hmm. airlines have lost you know between uh, uh, 60 and 80 percent of their traffic. And so we had to react very quickly. And actually, instead of stopping the digital transformation, here it, this has accelerated the digital transformation, but only in the uh, in the area where that were uh, required, you know, to uh, to to restart our industries and to deliver uh, everything that was needed in order to uh, to guarantee the safety of the passenger when they are traveling. So it sounds largely then that you were able to take the foundations that you'd already laid you know, for digital transformation with another objective in mind, like you say, kind of reducing carbon footprint and turn it towards dealing with the immediate crisis. Will you be able to turn it back again towards its original objective, I guess? Uh, I, I wish that uh, this will happen, but I'm afraid that there is part of our business that we have lost forever. So especially when you look at the business travel and all the, the business, you know, for international event conferences, I believe that there is a part of this business that will be replaced by, uh, you know, video conferencing platform. So this business is done. But yes, we hope that, uh, you know, uh, in 2024, uh, we will be back to maybe 80 percent of the, the, the volume of uh, that we had uh, before the crisis. And we hope that uh, this business will be much more sustainable. And that will be able, you know, to lower, you know, the, 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 the carbon emission and to and to improve, uh, you know, the sustainability of our, of our basic processes. Mm. So you've mentioned the kind of sustainability goals uh, of this project. Can you tell us uh, a little bit more about how you're using or how you're planning to use technology 
to meet these uh, sustainability goals? So one example, for example, is the, the, the collaboration <clears throat> uh, between all the parties uh, at the airport. Uh, you know, when you have a delay of an aircraft and where an aircraft is delayed and it cannot uh, land, he is mm. burning fuel. So this is an example where, uh, you know, if we are able to organize the, uh, all the, 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 the planning of the operation and to avoid to have any delay on the on the landing and the, the takeoff of the aircraft, uh, you know, we are going to reduce you know the, the the emission of carbon. So this is one example where technology by uh, allowing collaboration between all the parties in the airport that will prevent you know to have delays uh, in in the flight. Um, another example also will be also to uh, use uh, predictive analytics in order to plan the right capacity uh, for the for the aircraft in order you know to meet the the demand so in this case there will be no waste of resources and no waste of uh, you know uh, of uh, fuel emission or uh, so we will have the right uh, uh, of course uh, carbon emission sorry so this is obviously you know your own digital transformation project presumably some of your members or just airlines in general have their own digital transformation projects uh, ongoing before the crisis and you know, probably now how do those sort of mesh together um how much i guess conversation is there between you and the airlines okay so you're right that there is a part of digital transformation that is specific to the airline and it is usually around the, you know, the commercial aspect and the, the, the relationship with the passenger. But on the other side, you need to have international standards in order, you know, to allow airline to operate the same way everywhere in the world in, in all the airports. And so this is where that IATA is coming into the, the game in order to define these uh, international standards. Uh, one example of this standard, for example, is what we have announced recently at the, at the annual general, uh, general uh, meeting of IATA is that we are working on a, on a travel pass application that will uh, allow uh, airline, you know, to share uh, what is required for a passenger to board in an uh, aircraft. And in this case, if it is a medical certificate, it will be a medical certificate in addition to all, you know, the identity uh, passport or uh, any other of uh, document that they have to uh, uh, to show uh, in order to uh, to travel. Mm. So uh, IATA is there for two things: to define these international standards, so to avoid the airline to build solution that will be different everywhere in the world, but also to to try to modernize also the legacy system that the airline or, or have been using for a while. And especially in the ticket distribution, there is a lot of this system because, you know, now they cannot afford anymore to spend all this money in these uh, legacy systems. Ah, mm. Does that mean that I'm going to hear no more dot matrix printers as I'm waiting to board an airplane next time I go somewhere? <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good example because, you know, the, the, the electronic boarding pass is one standard that has been defined by IATA 10 years ago. And now we need also to progress on similar standards, for example, for back tag, you know, for, uh, so yes, the, the plan is to have a contactless experience of the passenger in the airport. And for that, you need IATA to coordinate, you know, the, all the stakeholders in the industry to work together and to agree on standards that will be used uh, globally. Hmm. So on the subject of legacy technology, uh, I it would imagine most of our listeners will be familiar with certain aspects of the kind of passenger facing airline technology. Jane, as you mentioned, the dot matrix printers for boarding passes and uh, some of the kind of uh, gate technology. Uh, but what are some of the kind of back office systems, if you like, uh, that are going to be part of these modernization efforts that passengers may not be uh, familiar with? So one of the, the biggest challenge that we have is in terms of identity management. So IATA has developed a, a standard called uh, One ID, which is, you know, to allow, you know, all the self-service uh, system to use 
uh, identity from identity providers. So in this case, it will be, for example, your biometric passport and to be able, you know, to facilitate, you know, all the journey in the airport. And so all these uh, standards have to be accepted by authorities, have to be accepted, of course, by, you know, the, 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 the custom and have to be implemented, uh, you know, everywhere uh, in the world. So this is the, the, the kind of example on the back office that will allow, you know, uh, for example, uh, uh, an automated uh, boarding gate to read your passport, to check that, of course, you know, the, 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 the passport is, uh, the, the, the biometrics is in line with what has been stored on the passport to let you go in and to automate, you know, the, the, the gate. So this kind of example, uh, now we are moving uh, forward to have a full contactless uh, experience in the airport and using uh, mobile technology, so mainly your uh, mobile phone, in order also to facilitate, to facilitate that. So instead of having a passport, Tomorrow, you will have on your mobile phone the proof of your identity that will be uh, checked by the authorities to let you go in. I have to ask, is your, the move to you contactless, is that something that predated the pandemic or is it a response to it? Because you know, one of the, the big things that's come out of this is that touchscreen technology has gone from being you know, like the go-to to something that you literally don't want to touch with a barge pole. <laughs> so yeah, was this a project that was already underway or is it a response to the pandemic? So it is both actually. So the project was on the way to use one ID in order to facilitate the journey. And the plan was to use some touch technology. But it is true that the pandemic has changed that and the same way that, you know, contactless payment have become the norm. Now we have also, we have changed the, 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 the model. So we have adapted the model in order to, uh, to move to a contactless experience. So yes, the pandemic has changed a little bit. And there is good news in the pandemic is that it has demonstrated that it was, it was possible to use the technology. It was possible to leverage the technology. Before we had a lot of resistance. And uh, during the crisis, we have seen that this uh, resistance growing away because, of course, the problem to solve was bigger than, you know, the resistance that we had before. We're going to take a short break now. But when we come back, we'll be finding out more about IASA's transformation and the benefits that it expects to reap from it. See you after the break. Welcome back. Now, Pascal, can you tell us a little bit more about the specifics of the project that IATA's undertaken? What kind of systems and processes are you looking to modernize? What kind of technologies are you looking to deploy to meet these goals? Okay, so one of the objectives that we have is to put our data at work. And so to use all the information that IATA is collecting in order to provide to the airlines, to our members, you know, all the predictive analytics that they need to have. Especially because of the crisis, you know, all their model that was based on historical consumption are not working any longer. So now they are telling us that they want us to give them some uh, prediction model based on only the last months of activity because today they are not capable to have visibility. So one of the projects that we have is to build a unified infrastructure for uh, business intelligence, including uh, machine learning, including data lake, and of course leveraging you know, cloud technology, because it is something that you have to do with the cloud. It's not something that you can build in your own data center. And so this is why that we have started this project uh, using uh, AWS as, uh, you know, the, the, the public cloud and using Rackspace also as the company helping us to deliver all the managed services. So the plan is to deliver uh, a business intelligence environment, so it's, uh, it's a data lake, that will allow to bring together all the data that we have at IATA and to enrich, you know, this data in order to give uh, to airline uh, predictive uh, reports on their activities, so whether it is for uh, airport activities, whether it is for cargo activities, or whether it is for passenger uh, activity as well. 
Are there any sort of data protection or anonymization considerations here, or is it literally just looking at the flow of people, um, you know, I guess, as a as a flock or a group without taking anything from their personal identifiable information? And of course, we have to know, we have to comply with uh, data privacy uh, regulation. In this case, yes, the business intelligence product will be working on anonymized data. So uh, all the BI product that we have, have you know, data that are anonymized, whether it is uh, for compliance with uh, GDPR or data privacy regulation, but also we have also some sensitive data, for example, incident you know, data set that mm. needs also to be protected. So yes, of course, in the design of uh, this uh, environment, the, the security will take uh, a major part and the security is not only, you know, for the protection of the sensitive data, but it's also for the safety of the operation. Mm. Because uh, if in an airport, you know, you have to upload uh, some uh, uh, software into the aircraft, you know that now uh, you have more computers in the aircraft than uh, you have in your data center. Of course, we will have also to guarantee that the safety and the compliance with the, the the cybersecurity obligation that we have will be respected. So, of course, yeah, there is a, a very strict uh, cybersecurity uh, design in everything that we are doing. So, Pascal, one of the uh, things that you've spoken about, kind of wanting to to deploy as part of this, is technologies like uh, DevOps and uh, containers. How are these technologies going to benefit your organization and your member organizations? So um, it's very simple. It will allow us to do more with less uh, resources. And it will allow us to avoid the waste uh, of, uh, of resources because we don't have, you know, uh, we cannot afford uh, to spend too much because of the, of the financial crisis. We have to make sure that all the resources that we will spend will go spot on on, on the result. So uh, this is why that with DevOps, we are promoting self-service platform in order to deliver faster, in order also to adapt to the changing environment, because the crisis mm. has demonstrated also that things can change overnight. We might have regulation also changing overnight. So DevOps will help us also to deliver, to deliver faster and to be more agile. Meaning that if we have to change something, we will be able also to change uh, to change it faster than uh, what it was before. I guess the ability to change course is just as important for the uh, organizations in the back office as well as the pilots actually flying the plane. So how far along are you into this uh, project? Have you started seeing any operational benefits from it yet or is it still in the kind of early stages? So we are in the early stages because uh, the plan is to start to deliver the first BI application in the first quarter of 2021. So yes, we have seen some benefit in terms of velocity and time to deliver and time to develop. We have seen also some benefit with the flexibility that, uh, that this was bringing in terms of partnership with also external vendors. So. Um, in the in the product design, we have seen the, the benefit, but of course, the most important will be to release the, uh, the 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 application and the system, and to be able also after you know to uh, to deliver the, the the product roadmap and to adapt you know this system to the you know the uh, the, the the changing needs uh, of our customers, whether it is the airline or whether it is the passenger of of the airlines. You mentioned earlier as well that you expect the impact of COVID-19 on the industry to last for the next sort of four to five years and that what a good 20% of um, airlines previous business is gone. Will the digital transformation project happening at the moment help to, I guess, mitigate those effects at all? Or is it just going to be a case of this is the way things are now and this, you just have to deal with the reality as it is. Actually, both. So we, we have to deal with the reality 
and the airline that will be able to survive or the one that will be able to deliver what is required and what is expected by the by the passenger so the 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 reality is the, the new norm and we have to adapt and if we are not able to adapt uh, we will we will disappear but also uh, the the plan is also to uh, to be more effective and to be more sustainable and mm -hmm. so the work that we are doing in terms of sustainability started long time before the crisis has been impacted by the crisis sometimes in a good way because the amount of travel has been reduced so of course the amount of emission has been reduced and we know that if we want to restart we will have to restart differently and we will have to restart by lowering uh, our carbon emission mm. so my answer is is both so we need uh, we have no choice than to adapt to the new reality and we have to use the technology to allow us to do this adaptation but we need on the other end also to continue you know the journey that we have uh, started in order to uh, to uh, uh, to push for a sustainable travel. So Jane and myself are both frequent flyers, or at least we were uh, before the pandemic hit. But if and when we do take to the skies again, how will these projects improve our experience as passengers? Okay, so first I would like to thank you for your business and I hope that you will continue <laughs> to be a frequent a flyer. So um, the experience for the during the journey uh, should be better so we are working very hard to avoid any delay any queuing at the airport whether it is at the departure or whether it is at the arrival so uh, it's really to uh, to to push for uh, a continuous travel experience that will be uh, more enjoyable with also a lot of activities that will be offloaded uh, you know, and that will happen before, you know, you arrive at the airport. So really, the, our objective is for you to have a smooth and enjoyable experience and with far less delay and far uh, less, you know, issues uh, somewhere in the middle of your travel that, of course, you know, the, the passenger doesn't want to, uh, to see. Mm. Although if you do eliminate uh, delays at the airport and waiting at the airport, that means, Jane, that you'll never be able to write another view from the airport column. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. Mm. But you, One of... you can always enjoy your time at the airport and maybe doing other activities while you will be at the airport. You have no <laughs> idea how early I turn up to airports and then sit around going, well, I've got three hours until I need to be at the gate. So... Uh... <laughs> I guess I'll go and eat some breakfast or something. So, yeah. It's not as bad as uh, some people that we know that arrive at the airport literally the day before their flights, yes. which is uh, <laughs> slightly overkill. As, yeah, as long as you don't arrive the minute after the flight, it will be okay. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for in this week's episode. But thanks once again to Ayata's Pascal Buchner for joining us. So thank you. It was a pleasure for me to, uh, to talk to you. You can find links to everything we've spoken about in the show notes and even more on our website, www.itpro.co.uk. Don't forget to subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you can, leave us a rating and a review. We'll be back next week with more from the world of IT. But until then, goodbye. Bye. The IT Pro Podcast is brought to you by the Dennis Podcast Network.